एस एल टी मोबिजा दी कनेक्शन एस एल टी मोबिजा दी कनेक्शन Tonight, new developments. Sri Lanka to receive its first Covax vaccine batch on Sunday as COVID-19 burials issue resurfaces with location change. Reports and complaints. Is to report final copies presented to chief prelates as the cardinal sword petition taken up in the court of appeal. Building the future. The country's first LNG power plant begins constructions promising cheaper and cleaner power. Walking for change. Jaffna to Dondra National Unity Walk convener accuses diaspora of using poverty as a political tool. Poverty is the cause of terrorism. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine this Friday, the 5th of March, 2021. Alcohol adango hand sanitizer bavita karanne. Lady roga ati karanu visha bija valuta erahi vasatan karanne. Handun vadi me milan rupiah tunse panhai. From Ada Verana. This is Ada Verena first at nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamma Kekanaika. Now, Sri Lanka is set to receive the first batch of COVID-19 vaccines promised under the World Health Organization's COVAX facility on the coming Sunday. The consignment will contain 264,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which will be used on people above the age of 60, residing in high-risk areas. So far, the country have uh, received 1 million doses of the Indian-manufactured Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, enough to cover 500,000 people. The first batch of 500,000 vials were donated by India, while Sri Lanka purchased the other 500,000 doses from the Serum Institute in India. During the course of yesterday, Sri Lanka confirmed 384 novel coronavirus infections, which also included 33 imported cases. The locally transmitted cases spanned across 21 districts, out of which Colombo reported the highest, with 78. As far as other infections are concerned, 64 were reported from Ratnapura, 35 from Kandy, 21 from Gampa, while 19 were confirmed from the Badulla district. The remainder of the 134 cases were detected across 16 other districts. Yesterday alone, 12,883 members of the public have undergone PCR tests. As for today, Commander of the Army General Shavendra Silva confirmed the detection of 182 COVID-19 patients, which leaves the number of active cases at 2,982. Meanwhile with 485 patients being given the all clear to return to their daily lives today the total number of recoveries in the island stands at 81321 Meanwhile 34 cases of novel coronavirus have emerged from the cancer unit at the regional hospital in Badulla Among the positive patients are a doctor two nurses two members of the junior staff 22 patients and seven patient care attendants Meanwhile in Kasbava eight employees of the municipal council have tested positive for the virus today. Following the detections public services of the municipal council were suspended until further notice. A total of 159 people including councillors and staff members identified as associates were sent for PCR test today. Although activities of the establishment suspended, Chairman of the Kasbava Municipal Council Lakshman Pereira says that assessment taxes and tax payments can be made online. In the meantime, a further five people succumbed to COVID-19 yesterday. The fatalities were reported from the areas of Ussapitiya, Mattakulia, Kolonava, Borleskamo, and Giriulla. And today, a further five fell prey to the virus, taking the country's death toll to 494. On the vaccination front the Indian manufactured Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was administered to a number of people in several areas today State Minister of Primary Health Care Epidemics and Covid Disease Control Dr Sudarshini Fernando Pillai visited the vaccination center set up at the Gotami Temple in Boralla to inspect its activities 
Offering clarification on the recent deaths of two persons following vaccination, State Minister Fernando Pulle said that as per post-mortem reports, their cause of death is cardiac arrest. What's more, Sri Lanka will receive its first batch of COVID-19 vaccines under the World Health Organization's COVAX facility on Sunday the 7th of March. Under the facility, the first shipment will contain 264,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. As part of the agreement between the Ministry of Health and the COVAX facility, 1.44 million doses will be supplied to the island at various stages until May this year. The first 264,000 doses from COVAX will be for members of the public above the age of 60, residing in high-risk areas. Meanwhile, convening a media briefing today, representatives of the Alliance of Sri Lankan Immigrants called on the government to allow returning expatriates to be home quarantined. Sri Lanka's best health insurance with the fastest claim settlement, SoftLogic Life. Pay just 500,000 rupees to reserve your unit today. Mulberry Residence. In the meantime, Sri Lanka today commenced the burials of COVID-19 deceased after the government reversed its decision on mandatory cremations, however, at a different location to the one initially approved on the island of Iranathil. Nine infected remains were accordingly buried today at a site in the area of Odamawadin Batiklo under strict health and safety guidelines. Meanwhile, the area of Irakamam has also been suggested as a possible burial site. The government issued a Gazette notification on the 25th of last month granting permission to carry out burials of COVID-19 deceased. A special committee then identified the island of Iranathiu as a suitable location for burials to be conducted, while adding that the location is not the only burial site. The move, however, came in for severe backlash from the residents of Iranathiu Island, who staged a protest citing a threat to their water resources. In addition, Eastern Province Director of Health Services Alagia Latha told other Derana that the areas of Uddamavadi in Batiklo as well as Irakamam in Ampara have been recommended as possible sites for the burial of COVID-19 deceased. Accordingly, the bodies of nine people who died of COVID-19 were buried for the first time today in the area of Uddamavadi in Batiklo. Religious rituals for the dead were performed at the Kartangudi Base Hospital, following which the bodies were transported to the burial ground by health and security officials. Meanwhile, during a gathering today, Minister of Fisheries Douglas Devananda said that the Cabinet would provide a favourable response before Monday the 8th on the mounting opposition against burial of COVID-19 victims in the island of Iranathiu. The minister added that during his telephone conversations with the president, the prime minister and the minister of health, he made sure to point out the fact that burying the infected bodies in Iranathiu is inappropriate. The minister has suggested several alternative islands instead of Iranathiu. Sri Lanka human rights activist and attorney at law Ranita Nyanaraja is among the recipients of 2021 International Women of Courage Award bestowed by the United States Secretary of State. The U.S. State Department announced the list of award recipients from around the world yesterday with Jnana Raja among them. The State Department said that Jnana Raja continues to fight and defend the rights of the marginalized and vulnerable communities in the country despite threats and challenges by the state. It added that Jnana Raja has dedicated her career to accountability and justice for victims of enforced disappearances and prisoners detained often for years without charges under Sri Lanka's Prevention of Terrorism Act by providing free legal and related services. The U.S. State Department goes on to say, as an individual personally affected by the conflict and based on her extensive experience working with victims and their families, Nyana Raja has demonstrated tremendous passion and dedication to justice and accountability. Now then, poverty is the cause of terrorism and some northern politicians are intent on keeping status quo for the benefits of their own agendas. These are the words of Arun Siddhartan, the convener of Jaffna Civil Society Centre, which organised a peace walk from Point Pedro to Point Dondra. Jaffna Civil Society Centre organised a walk in the name of national unity from Point Pedro to Point Dondra, setting off on the first of this month. The group today stopped over at the Ruan Valley Sire in Anuradhapura and engaged in religious observances. Ekdas Namasya Hatta Ayedi Shelvanayagam Vatu Kotevala Mevagi Dupa Janata Vatiagan Akiva Apita Venam Rataka Piadan Duni Apia of the Gandoni Kiela Ekata He Tua Egulanda Tibuna Vena Neoliberal Natama Indian 
agendas. Idang ina demula jati ke sanda ane venda pulua, vignesharan venda pulua, ponna malam la venda pulua. Me khawurut me ape rata rata ta adre karna minusungwa. Nenda rata jiwat tece minusungwa. Nenda me ayah koi koi yari peter me ayah. Api ta allah ganda mari amar. Yogla ya apne ayah lebala nene yogla ya apne inwa dekil. Dem me mati ke ayah leno godak me janata. Dem mula janata ya apne janata. Dem me minusun te beda karna tamai. Balai illa nuan. Dem api ta suam pan le denda suam pan le denda kila kaya kan. Balat sabara dunna nene am kis suam pan nene. Tukar e एक तिबिच्चा आरु आवम बाले पाविता कर ले मैं मिनी सुनते वैरा करने तिबुने आई वैरा करे ने आई ये साली रिटर्न या पावर्टी इस द कोस ऑफ टेररिज्म मैं उस आवी टफ जाजला ठे ओ वो दान्ने द तो कोटे मैं आई वो दुपट का मैं इंतियांग इन्ने आप वो रास्तवाद ऐतिकरण्ड मैं गुलांग जेनिवा या नवा सिंगल जाने आटा दान्ने मैं गुलांग प्रश्न मुकाद देगी पित्ते का एक का गेदर में गेदर है सी ये टा आसी देने कीनो नंग आसु देने कीनो सिंगल भाषा वा कथा करना मिनुसु नंग in other stories, the petition filed by Archbishop of Colombo, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit, pertaining to the importation of 6,000 swords to the island during the time of the Easter attacks of 2019, was taken up before the Court of Appeal today. Meanwhile, copies of the report compiled by the Presidential Commission, which probed the attacks, were also handed over to the chief prelates of the Ramanya and Amarapura sects today. The chief prelates of the Malvata Naskiri chapters as well as His Eminence the Cardinal were also given the copies of the report at the beginning of the week. The Presidential Secretariat has presented copies of the final report on the Easter Sunday terror attacks compiled by the Presidential Commission of Inquiry to the chief prelate of the Ramanya sect, Agga Mahapandita Most Venerable, Makulavi Vimalathera. A copy of the report was also presented to Acting Chief Prelate of the Amarapura sect, Most Venerable Gangtune Assajithera. In the meantime, the petition filed by Archbishop of Colombo, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit, pertaining to the importation of 6,000 swords during the time of the Easter Sunday terror attacks, was taken up before the Court of Appeal today. Senior State Counsel representing the Attorney General's Department, Avanti Pereira, sought a date from the court to produce facts on whether an investigation has been launched on the matters pertaining to the case and the progress of the said investigations. Following consultations with her clients, the Defence Secretary and the Inspector General of Police. The court accepted the request and ordered the Senior State Counsel to report facts on the 31st of March. In the meantime, President's Counsel Sanjeeva Jayavardhana, representing His Eminence the Cardinal, told the court that information has been received that around 6,000 swords have been imported to the country following the Easter Sunday terror attacks. Further, it is revealed that 600 of the swords have been identified and the consignment had been imported by an individual named Mohammed Sattar upon the requirement of cinnamon grand bomber Mohammed Insaf. He added that 5,400 of the swords are still at large and His Eminence the Cardinal points out through his petition that it is not only a threat to the national security but also to public security. The petition calls on the court to order the security sector hierarchy to launch an investigation on the matter. We will see you once more on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Nivase meveni matupita rendana visibhi jasiya tanu navya atashima navya atma vinasha karana vim cleaners Welcome back. You're watching First at Night. Now, President Gautavi Rajpaksha today awarded presidential colours to two Air Force squadrons, namely the number 5 Fighter Squadron and number 6 Helicopter Squadron. Addressing the event, the Head of State reiterated his highest commitment to national security that lays the groundwork for a safe and secure environment for both the public and private sector to work towards the country's development. Such stability, he said, is the ideal environment that foreign investors look for in a potential destination. Two squadrons of the Sri Lanka Air Force were awarded presidential colours today in recognition of their outstanding service to the nation at the number five fighter squadron and the number six helicopter squadron. Sri Lanka Guman Hamadavi Seve Kala, Tama Jivite Pudakala, Sam Guan Hamada Sama Juke Kutama, Ape Jatia, Venuin Magi Gaurava Chare, Pirinam. Ape Pratipati Mala, Mahajanata, Vatidripat Kalavastavi, the Rate Sangwar the near Mulika Karagani Matanam, Jatika Arakshava Atishain, Vadagat Baba Pinwadun, Podgalekan Shetaveva, Rajan Shetaveva. Edineda Vadakati to Pavahariya Karava Karagatahake, Aparatatula Nidahas, 
सा आरक्षकारी वातावरण एक्ति बुन होत पामन है इसे नमैति नाम आयोजक के अनुपावा परेटेट पैमिनी नीन है मेनी साई नीति हाँ सामे मूली का कोटगे ने जाति का आरक्षा व ताहूर कर यानी मटापी मूल का त्वय देन में सैम पूर्व से कुटन में बीएन हाँ सेकंड तोर व जीवात्वय है कि सुरक्षित परिसरय आरक्षकारी राटा गोड़ेना Following the awarding of the presidential colours, the President then inspected the two C-130 squadrons of the Sri Lanka Air Force stationed at the Katunayaka Air Force Base. Following this, Commander of the Air Force Air Marshal Sudarshana Patirana then presented a commemorative memento to the President. The construction of the Lakdhanvi liquefied natural gas power plant in Kerala Pitya was flagged off this morning by Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha. On completion of the first phase of the country's first LNG power plant, the national grid will get an additional 220 megawatts of power and is expected to provide cheaper power with savings of up to 15 rupees per unit. According to Minister of Power Dallas Alahapiruma, this would calculate to annual savings of 12 billion rupees. Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa inaugurated the construction of the Lakdhanavi liquefied natural gas power plant in Kerala Pitya at a special ceremony held this morning. On completion, the liquefied natural gas power plant is set to become the first of its kind to be constructed in the country. The construction of the plant is expected to be completed in two phases, with the first phase to be completed in 21 months. On completion, the plant is expected to add 220 megawatts of power to the national grid. In addition, the completion of the second phase will add a further 130 megawatts to the national grid and increase the plant's total capacity to 350 megawatts. The total cost of the project is 150 million US dollars. Speaking at the launch event, State Minister of Solar Power, Wind and Hydropower Generation Projects Development, Dwinder Disanayaka revealed government plans to convert all the country's diesel power plants to LNG in the near future. The state minister added, however, that if the government cannot secure steady LNG supplies to the country, it would result in the country taking a step backward. Meanwhile, Minister of Power Dallas Ala Peruma stated that with Sri Lanka's dependence on fossil fuels, the switch to LNG power generation could result in savings of up to 15 rupees per unit of power generated. Further, the minister added that the Lakdhanavi plant by itself could supply 2 billion units out of the total 16 billion units required to power the country. He also stated that the government could look forward to savings of up to 12 billion rupees per annum from this project. Meanwhile, Premier Mahindra Rajapaksa stated that the government's policy is to complete all stalled projects faster and better than expected and not shelve them due to petty political reasons. <laughs> वड़ा आरंभ कर लो आतंकवाद के नवतो तो मापू किसी वक्त देशपाल न पटु परमार थे नवतो नहीं ने एशियाई लीड अत्वड़ा होने कारण में आवश्यक करी में अपने देख मोगे लाती है ना Director of the Environmental Studies and Services Division at the National Building Research Organization, Sarat Premasiv, says that contrary to reports, the people of Colombo do not need to fear low oxygen levels as no changes have been observed in atmospheric levels. He made these comments in response to a recent meeting that was held at the Ministry of Environment, which concluded that oxygen levels within Colombo are currently at low levels. Premasiri added that he believes that the ministry implied a reduction in air quality in Colombo instead. The Ministry of Environment recently announced that scientific surveys have confirmed that the percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere of the city of Colombo is gradually declining in, in proportion to its population. However, Director of the Environmental Studies and Services Division at the National Building Research Organization, Sabat Premasiri, says that the atmospheric oxygen levels have not been subjected to any change, but rather it is the air quality of the city of Colombo. If you think about ambient air, oxygen level is normally constant, volume-wise 20.95%. It is not changed so much uh, due to the normal situations. Air quality of the Colombo is reducing due to a lot of vehicles and other emissions. So the tree plantation is one of the precautions we can get for this air pollution reduction as well as temperature reduction, all those things. Carbon monoxide in Colombo as well, we receive some air pollution levels depending on the climate situation changing. Normally area-wise high pollution levels in Colombo, urban area, so that we can reduce it somewhat by introducing plant and also uh, by mainly if we can introduce some traffic management system 
system to reduce these traffic jams then it will more efficient to reduce air pollution in Colombo so that news is mainly not the reduction of uh, the oxygen level but reduction of air quality normally 18.5 levels is the affected level for pupils so there is no impact due to small changes of oxygen level the remains of our staff member Tarupati Uvindu Samarakon, who passed away in a collision during the early hours yesterday, were taken to his residence today. A skilled cameraman who had gained notoriety within the very short time he was with us. Tarupati was 24 at the time of his passing. Our staff transport met with a collision at around 1.40 a.m. yesterday in the area of Mavatagama in Kurunagala. The vehicle had veered off and collided with an ironwood tree. Five of our staff members were in the vehicle at the time of the collision and the locals ensured that they were admitted to hospital as quickly as possible. But for Tarupati Uvindu Samarakon, it was already too late. He was a camera assistant at the Adhidharana News Division with an effervescent personality. The 24-year-old joined the Derana family in March of 2019 and his can-do attitude coupled with pleasant mannerisms made him a figure of adoration. Tarupati's remains were brought to his residence in Galagidara today and his final rites will be performed on Sunday at the Galagidara Public Cemetery. May our fallen brother attain Nibbana. We will see you shortly. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is First at Night. Now, the Norwegian Development Finance Institution, Norfund, and the National Development Bank have struck a deal which will see Norfund becoming NDB's largest foreign shareholder. Norfund is the Norwegian investment fund for developing countries, and it is owned and funded by the Norwegian government. Norwegian ambassador to Sri Lanka, Trina Eskadel, believes that Norfund investment would convey a positive message to other potential investors in Sri Lanka. The National Development Bank and Norwegian Development Finance Institution, Norfund, inked an agreement for a 9.99% stake in the bank, making Norfund its largest foreign shareholder. The equity investment by Norfund is the first foreign equity placement agreement for NDB Bank. NDB Group CEO Dimanth Seneviratna stated that following Norfund's investment, the bank's overall foreign shareholding increases to around 21%. Under the agreement, no fund will participate in NDB's planned 8 billion rupees rights issue that NDB has already announced by way of subscribing to unsubscribed rights and also by way of a private placement if required. The bank announced that the private placement has been priced at a 10% premium to the rights issue at 82 rupees and 50 cents per share. NDB added that the equity infusion together with the proposed rights issue is expected to help buttress its TRI capital requirements, enabling its growth momentum and post-pandemic economic revival. The bank, however, noted today that the investment is subject to other conditions, including regulator and shareholders' approvals. The investment is no fund's first equity investment in Sri Lanka and it comes at a time when international rating agencies have downgraded Sri Lanka's credit rating. NDB chairman Eshana De Silva says that no fund's decision to invest in NDB shows the confidence they have in NDB and the Sri Lankan economy. Norwegian ambassador to Sri Lanka Trini Eskadel meanwhile says that this is a good indication of the faith and trust no fund has placed in the Sri Lankan private sector and expressed hope that it conveys a positive message to other potential investors. Now, Sri Lanka joined over 60 other countries in adopting a national financial inclusion strategy that aims to increase not only access to financial tools among its vast rural populace, but also increase education and awareness of the endless benefits of embracing digitalization. Speaking at a seminar following the launch, Central Bank Governor Professor W.D. Lakshman, however, cautioned that such a program would be doomed to fail if Sri Lanka's large 80% rural population aren't the primary focus and beneficiary of the scheme. Also addressing the event, Lanka Clear CEO Chandna De Silva outlined the massive GDP savings, including up to 0.5% of GDP in the country, can expect from shifting to a less cash and more digital lifestyle. 
The Central Bank of Sri Lanka launched the country's first national financial inclusion strategy yesterday with a view towards achieving a financially inclusive Sri Lanka where all individuals and enterprises are better informed and have fair and equitable access to a range of high quality, appropriate, secure and affordable financial products and services. In a media communique issued last evening, the central bank stated that the development of the NFIS was a multi-stakeholder effort led by the central bank, which encompassed the expertise of various public and private sector institutions across the economy. With the launch of the NFIS, Sri Lanka joins more than 60 countries across the world to have taken similar initiatives to improve their financial inclusion landscapes. Speaking at a seminar held yesterday following the launch, State Minister of Money and Capital Market and State Enterprise Reforms Ajit Nevad Cabral defined financial inclusion as not only the provision of facilities, but more importantly, the understanding of how to use them. Financial inclusion is not just providing money, to providing the rest of the facilities as well as the understanding to deal with it. That means you have to make sure that there is enough business opportunities, that he is having training, he understands what business is, he understands the difference between turnover and profit perhaps. All these things are important factors. What we sometimes miss out is we provide a ad hoc financial inclusion which doesn't lead to the sustainable financial inclusion. Meanwhile, Lanka clear CEO Chana De Silva says that such a project must be approached in the context of Sri Lanka's unique digital landscape and not modelled on the success of other countries' rollouts. We first need to understand what the digital landscape of the country is. So when we look at digital landscape, we have 21.4 million population in the country, out of which 18.8% is urban, which means 81% of the population is rural. 30.4 million SIMs issued in the market, which is 142% of the population. Then we have 10.9 million internet users, which is 50.8% of the population. And we have 7.9 million active social media users, which is 36.8% of the population. So first, we can look at this 37% who are active social media users. So that is the digital landscape. But the other side is what happens is we try to bring digital just because it works in another country and we think that it will work here. It doesn't work because it's a context. De Silva also outlined the massive savings Sri Lanka could expect from full digitalization, including up to 1.5% of GDP for the maintaining of physical cash, which he said could be better utilized on social welfare instead. The currency in circulation is in Q3 2020 is 775 billion. It almost costs about 1.5% of GDP to a country to maintain cash. 2018, the spend on education was 2.1% of GDP, but we are spending 1.5% on cash. So imagine if we can shift 30% of the population into digital, we are going to save half a percent GDP, which can be used for social welfare, samurdhi programs. So that's one economic saving that we can achieve using digital finance. The second one is inflow of foreign exchange. We are losing in excess of 6 billion rupees a year because every transaction which is local, we are paying in dollars to these professional players. So if, if we use these channels that we have already established, we are going to save in excess of 6 billion. So that is an economic saving when we are struggling with foreign exchange right now, which we can achieve. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.